This is the BBC third programme. We present the primal scene, as it were. Nine studies in disloyalty by Henry Reid. In this programme, the researches of Herbert Reeve into the lives of Richard Schoen, Hilda Tablet and others are brought to a conclusion. Mr Reeve. In the last analysis, everyone would, we think, agree that there are certain moments in the lives of all of us that we later realise to have been unobserved turning points in our destiny. If that had not happened then, we may well ask ourselves, would this be happening now? No, we may well answer, it would not. In the last analysis, we ourselves may well say that the most momentous such turning point in our own life occurred one afternoon last spring. We had, as so often, proceeded to 109 Coptic Street in order to report progress to our friend Hilda Tablet about the biography of herself which she had so kindly allowed us to embark on some years earlier. The progress we had to report was, we confess, scant indeed. Nonetheless, we were about to report it. Much to our surprise, the door was opened to us by Hilda's former secretary, Mr Evelyn Baxter. It was some two years since we had last seen him, during which time he had, like so many, been gallantly serving his term in the army. We could see at once that the experience had left its mark on him. Hello. Hi. Uh, hello, Evelyn. Hello. Oh, how, how nice to see you. Uh, are you on leave? No, Mr. Reeve, they've let me out. You mean you... you... Yes, Mr. Reeve, I'm back in Civvy Street. Are you? Uh, are you glad? Ooh. Well, well, it's splendid news, Evelyn. I hope we should be seeing a lot of you. Thank you, Mr. Reeve. Is that you, Bertie? Uh, yes, Hilda, it's me. It's what? I. Can't you bring Bertie in, Evelyn? What do you think you're doing? Mr. Reeve and I were having a touching reunion. Oh, excuse the silly young chump, Bertie. He's only just been demobbed. He's overexcited. Oh, naturally. Oh, nice to see him back, isn't it? Think it's altered him? Uh, well... Don't be afraid to say, Mr. Reeve. Well, a little, perhaps? It's made a man of me. Ha! Well, it did while I was in, I mean. I'm out now. Come along and have some tea, buddy. Oh, Mr. Reeve, how nice. You come on a day of good <laughs> news. First we have Evelyn zurückgekommen, and then we have the yacht. No, damn it, Elsa. I said I was going to be the one who told Bertie. Uh, good news? Oh, I should say so. Bertie, regard this simple missive. It's a cable, Hilda. Read it, Bertie. Read it loudly, Mr. Reeve. Yes, read it out. If you can. Uh, uh, overwhelmed by bitter memories. Oh, oh, do you really want me to read this, Hilda? Sure. Only for bitter, read butter throughout. Uh, overwhelmed by b utter memories, letter follows. Insist you make me similar b butter, but hellish theme, letter follows. Happy place, yatch. Yatch? For yatch, read yacht. Oh, yes. Uh, happy place yacht at your disposal, letter follows, must be hellish and better than butter, but the same sort, Aeschylus, letter follows, Aeschylus. Well, Bertie. But, uh, someone's going to send you a letter, Hilda. They have, Bertie, they have. But um, who exactly, Hilda? Does the name Aeschylus mean nothing to you, Bertie? Well, of course, Hilda, the Aristia is one of my... Bertie, dear, be your age. Have you never heard of one Aeschylus Aphonitis? But the, the, the Greek multimillionaire? The same, Bertie, the same. Oh, but how splendid he'll I, I didn't know you knew him. There's much about my life that you are unaware of, Bertie. Yes, Hilda. We met him at a banquet. Oh. I, I don't understand all these references to butter, Hilda. You've not by any chance heard of a little operatic entertainment I once had a hand in? Oh, Emily Butter, Hilda. The same, Bertie, the same. You, you mean he wants you to write another one? Yes, <laughs> you're getting it, Bertie, gradually. <laughs> On a uh, hellish theme, it says. A hellish read Hellenic throughout. I expect you could make it pretty hellish as well, dear, if you try. And isn't it so very nice, Mr. Reeve? We shall all be going on the yacht together. All? Well, my dear old Bertie, you don't think I'd leave you out, do you? Here's Aeschylus's letter, bless his old heart. He says, I know that creative is a work very hard to do. I should know. I created $23 million last year, and I could never have done that without the constant sympathy of my friends. 
So bring anyone along you think would be useful to you. Make a happy party of it. He's a deeply understanding man, as you see. Oh, yes, at the banquet. He gave most of his own food to me. And such a beautiful round chin. Quite, quite purple. Oh, lovely color for a lampshade. So you see, Bertie, I can take whoever I want. I thought we might perhaps take those nice young showing kits from Mousset with us. And, of course, poor old Nancy. And there'll be you and Elsa and And Evelyn. And my mum. Well, uh... I haven't definitely promised that yet. Evelyn. And my mum, dear. We, we must see. And well, largely on your account, Bertie, I shall ask old General Gland along. General Gland? We shall find him invaluable when we get to Greece. After all, he's a superb classical scholar. Is he? Oh, yes. He's in the great soldier scholar tradition, like uh, Wavell and uh, Lawrence and those chaps. Uh, uh, how, how do you know, Hilda? He told me. There's one difficulty, of course, about taking him. Uh, only one, Hilda? Yes, he is. He's Connie Schoen's brother. It means we really ought to take Connie and Stephen as well. That's a bit of a facer, isn't it? Still, I'm not really a girl to leave anybody out of anything I think they ought to be in on. We, we are sorry to have to mention it so early... But the still admirable third programme has in recent times been rudely truncated. We shall return to this point later. We mention it now merely to explain why we must move so precipitately forward to the first happy day when we all assembled at the beautiful and romantic port of Algeciras in southern Spain to join Mr. Athanasius's splendid yacht, the Jocasta. We all fell in love with her almost without knowing it. What a radiant vision she was, white and gleaming from her top sails to, uh, to her lower ones. Th there was no sign so far of Mr. Athanasius, our generous host. But Hilda was there, looking especially charming in her dazzling white P.E. jacket, slacks and, uh, and cap. How warmly and affectionately she greeted everyone. General Land, welcome aboard, General. Well, I am glad to see you again, Miss Tabbot. Very, very glad indeed. Thanks. Same here. Say? Same here. Uh, same here, yes, rather. Very pleasant. And isn't this a lovely spot? Listen to those church bells in the harbor. Awful, aren't they? Yes, beautiful sound. And Reeve tells me you're uh, thinking of trying your hand at a bit of music, Miss Tablet. Did he? Oh, well, well, you chaps will gossip, I know. Oh, please, don't think that, Miss Tablet. There, there, there was nothing of that on my part. And you can trust me not to let it go any further. Well, thanks. Yes, I'm very sorry if I've unwittingly trespassed on some intimate secret. Very sorry, indeed. We all have our finer feelings, haven't we, Reeve? <laughs> yes, indeed, most certainly. Some of us, at any rate. I'm deeply sorry if I've offended you, Miss Tablet. Hey, Reeve, hmm? don't move away. Just stand there by that piece of rope. Well, of course you want to. And don't mumble, man. I've spoken to you about it before. Dreadful it is the way he keeps on chuntering away to himself the whole time. Oh, come, General Glenn. Come, come, old thing. Say? Well, I won't have old Bertie bullied, damn it. Why? Why well, not? Well, damn it. Yes, but he's no call to go spreading rumours like that about a lady. Damn that, if it comes to it. Now, I'm very disappointed with him. Uh, said you were thinking of taking up music. Well, it has crossed my mind, as a matter of fact. Really? Have you ever tried it before? Oh, I have been known to jot down the odd bar or two from time to time. Oh, I say, how jolly spanking splendid. <laughs> All right, Reeve, you can move now. I am delighted to hear that, Miss Tabbot. Oh, shucks, it's nothing, really. Oh, but by golly, it is by golly. Even if it never comes to anything, you'll always be able to tell yourself you've tried your best. Yes, that's true. Yes, by golly. <laughs> Will it be the jazz or the classical? Well, uh... I quite understand, yes. Uh, Reeve, uh, just move down the deck for a few minutes, will you? You can have the utmost confidence in me, Miss Tablet. And I'll see Reeve keeps his mouth shut in future. He doesn't mean any harm. He's just a bit frivolous about everything, that's all. Yes, that's all. That's all it is. Oh, but I love music. I like all sound, but music in especial. You can hear it so well. Well, except when it stops, of course. Oh, it's dreadful when it stops. I missed it terribly in the jungle. Listen to those bells again. 
Wish I had my tape recorder here. Oh, you've got one of those things, have you? Oh, yes, wonderful they are. Beauty becomes fadeless thereby. Sure. I make Reeve come round and help me with it sometimes. We spent one whole evening a few weeks ago recording a very loud and beautiful chromium-plated bicycle bell. I bought it specially. Hmm? Dreadfully tiring to the thumb, of course, but oh, it was worth it. It was worth it. We got two complete tapes of it. About four hours it plays for, altogether. The bell was completely worn out, of course, by the time we'd finished, but we've got it for good, in a sense, preserved. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Yes, its loveliness increases. Yes, there's a special knob for that. Very loud you can get it. We had the police up one night. Oh, uh? Yes, they thought there was a fire. Wasn't, of course. Ah, I miss it being away from it. But it's quite safe. I've lodged it at the bank. And, of course, I'm very, very grateful to be coming on this cruise, Miss Tablet. And I'm very grateful to think you're going to act as our guide, General. It's most kind of you. That, Miss Tablet, is my privilege. I've suggested to the others we all go ashore to the harbour for dinner. Good idea. See you later, then, eh? Ever yours to command, Miss Tablet. <laughs> all right, Reeve. You can come back now. Well, what are you staring at, man? I, I was just watching the sunset. Where? Oh, yes. It may be some lack in myself, of course, but it always seems to me there's something dreadfully inaudible about a sunset. Still, enjoy it. While it lasts. There was indeed something about that first Mediterranean sunset over Algeciras most potently evocative. It recalled inevitably some of Richard Schoen's memorable descriptions. Would the great man himself had been with us to see it. The splendid luminary, uh, uh, the, the sun, was descending in, in, in all its splendor behind the, uh, the hills which were splendidly silhouetted, silhouetted against the powerful light of the, the descending lum the, the sun, uh, as it went down in uh, 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 behind the hills. One couldn't, of course, hope to express the sight as Schoen himself would have done. And what are you contemplating with such absorption, Mr. Reeve? Oh, 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 good evening, Mr. Schoen. I was watching the sunset. And recalling, no doubt, the descriptions of it with which my late brother was wont to bedizen his opening chapter. Well, no. Uh, well, yes, a little, perhaps. Yeah. What, what a lot of enormous jellyfish there seem to be on the sea at this point. Yes. Rather horrible, aren't they? They are as God made them, Mr. Reed. They seem to be turned inside out. That happens to many of us on the ebb tide of life, Mr. Reed. Y yes, I, I suppose so. Yes. Uh, I wonder if they sting. Oh, no, Mr. Reed. They are not human enough to sting. I, I haven't seen Mrs. Shearn yet. If she's well, I hope. Uh, my lady wife is her usual flamboyant self. She has repaired to her cabin to attend to the wants of her feline retinue. But, uh, Mr. Sherwin, do you mean that Mrs. Sherwin has actually brought the pussy's, uh, her cat, with her? Uh, on the boat? I'm afraid so, Mr. Reeve. Indeed, I encouraged her to do so. I live, of course, only for her happiness. I am sorry if the thought of their presence incommodes you. Uh, no, no, no. Only I... Uh... I was thinking of when we got back to England. Yes, Mr. Reeve. Well, the poor creatures will surely have to stay in quarantine for six months. Yes, Mr. Reeve. Does Mrs. Sherwin know that? No, Mr. Reeve. Not yet. But, Mr. Sherwin, how will she bear to be separated from them for six whole months? Oh, I trust there will be no question of separation, Mr. Reeve. I'm sure she will insist on staying with them till the crack of doom, if needs be. With such of them, that is to say, as do not slip overboard during the voyage. Ah, uh, here come my lunatic sister-in-law and her unseemly brood. Hello, Mr. Reeve. Isn't this spiffle? Oh, how do you do? Jolly glad you've come too, Mr. It Reeve. It is good to see you all again. Good evening, Mr. Reeve. Uh, hello. Wacky great boat this, isn't it, Mr. Reeve? Yes, George. Super. Ah, <laughs> uh, Still writing songs, Anne? Oh, well, I hope to while I'm here, of course. I'm sure you'll find plenty of inspiration here. Uh, yes, we're all going to look for some now, in good the harbour. Mr. Reeve, oh, I was goodness. so hoping you'd be here too. It is kind of dear Miss Tablet to ask us, isn't it? Rather. We're all most grateful. 
I'm so sorry I can't come with you all to the town. I'm sure it will be lovely. Oh, uh, are we all going to the town? Yes, we are all to be conducted uh, to enjoy ourselves under the guidance of my brother-in-law, General Glenn. Oh, indeed. Whether in single file or double, he has not yet permitted himself to divulge. I should so like to come too, but I've so much unpacking to do. And poor Janet has sprained her ankle. Oh, I'm so sorry. But perhaps I can go down there tomorrow. I adore seeing strange places. Yes, I'm sure. Hello, folks. Are we all ready? Oh, I, I think so, Miss Tablet. Yes, except... Uh, Elsa! Uh, Hello, Steve, dear. Hello, Hilda, dear. Coming ashore with us? Of course, Hilda, dear. <laughs> Elsa! I am already here. Good. Are we all set? Save for my dear brother-in-law, yes. We can't, of course, be expected to budge without him. Stephen! Connie is calling you, Stephen. Stephen, dear. Ask her what I've done wrong now, will you, please? What has she done? Oh, what is it, dear? What? She says, don't you want something to put round your neck, dear? No, thank you. Tell her I have my millstone. He says he has his millstone, dear. Oh, well, very well. Have a nice time, all of you. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Where's Evelyn? I could not find him anywhere. Well, where is he? Perhaps he's drowned. Don't be silly. He's sulking because I wouldn't let him bring that ghastly mum of his. Now then, are we all ready? <laughs> are we all ready? All ready to go? Only when you give the word, Arthur. How do you wish us to proceed? Oh, open order, I think, don't you? Open order, nothing too formal. Just all keep close in behind me. Bertie, do go and look for Evelyn and bring him along, will you? Uh, we'll go on, shall we, General? Bertie can follow us. Uh, yes, yes, all right, yes. So long as he doesn't straggle. Uh, don't straggle, will you, Reeve? No, 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 of course not. Good, well, then let's away. Do be careful. George, do be careful. Okay, Owen, hold on to Brian. George, mind the gangplank. Do be careful, Owen. Oh, do take care of the boy. Evelyn, are, are you there? Evelyn, are you anywhere about? Hello? Oh, is that you, Evelyn? Well, no, it's me, I'm afraid. Oh, who's that? Hello, Mr. Reeve. You won't remember me, I expect. I'm Janet Schoen. Owen's sister. Oh, but of course I remember you, Miss Schoen. Ah, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you since the first time you came down to Mousset. No, my visits always seem to have been when you were away at Cambridge. Yes, pity. I, I'm so sorry to hear about your ankle. Hmm? Oh, oh that's nothing much. Uh, how did it happen? I don't know, really. Just due to guilt, I expect. Uh, to what? Guilt. Most sprained ankles are, after all. Oh, well, I'm sure you have nothing to feel guilty about, Miss Schoen. Good God, who hasn't? Are you still writing that biography of Uncle Dick, Mr. Reeve? Well, uh, I haven't actually begun to write it yet. How's that? Well, uh, I still have rather a lot of data to sort. And, well, there have been other things. Oh, yes. They say you're writing a book about Miss Tablet. Yes, I'm afraid. Yes, yes, I am. I didn't know you were an authority on music. Oh, I'm not. It, it's another biography I'm supposed to be writing. Uh, actually, I haven't really quite begun that either so far. Hmm. Interesting that you haven't begun either of them. Well, I, I think it might be more interesting if I had. Yes. Yes, you'll have identified Richard Schoen with your father, of course. Oh, I, I really don't And Miss Tablet with your mother. No, no, God forbid. Uh, well, I mean, Hilda always been very kind, of course. But, yes, uh, yes, I think I see why you can't begin the biographies. Not that I'm in any way an authority. But I should think it's probable that the combined parent image and the superego has been projected outwards onto Schoen and Miss Tablet. Hmm? And the reason you can't begin to work on either of them separately may be due to unconscious fear of punishment at the thought of disturbing their embrace, you know? But, Miss Schoen, such a thought never entered my head. Oh, but the fantasy would be purely unconscious, of course. I, um, I think I ought to get on with looking for Evelyn. I saw him going ashore half an hour ago. Oh. Well, in that case, I suppose I'd better go on after the others. Yes, I'm sorry I can't come. This damned ankle. I hope you'll still be up when we get back. Well, there's always tomorrow. Yes, it's lovely to get away from it, isn't it? Do you know the Mediterranean? Not really, no. Oh, you'll love it, Miss Schoen. Mm, expect so, yes. Isn't it all a bit overrated? Oh, no, Miss Schoen. I always think of it as a source of, of all its finest and most enduring in our culture. So people say. But of course it is, Miss Schoen. 
I always think the Mediterranean is the, the primal scene, as it were, of Western civilization. The what, Mr. Reed? <laughs> Absolutely marvellous and so loud and clear, isn't it, Miss Tablet? You're telling me. It is the pure flamenco. I should so like to sing such music. I'm sure dear Hilda could write some for you, Miss Tablet. No, dear Steve, dear Hilda Cook. It is so vibrant and fluctuating, and I so much like that. It is a music rich and well nourished. Perhaps one should try to, to eat a little more. Jolly fine music, isn't it, Miss Tablet? I suppose so. Apart from being a stupefying bore, I suppose it is, yes. I like it. It's novel, of course. It but... damn well isn't, old cock. It's as old as your Aunt Amy. No, but what I mean is, it's a, a novel. It makes a good sound. It's, it's what I call redolent. It's what I call hell. And it's vital. No, it isn't. I would say it's somehow redolent and full of vitality. Well, I would say it's got about as much life in it as a potting shrimp. Well, I think we're probably both trying to say the same thing in different words. Oh, uh, what do you think, Steve? Oh, I agree with you, Hilda, dear. Oh, so do I. Dear Steve. Dear Hilda. Hello. 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 Where on earth have you been? Been for a little walk. What, all by yourself? No, dear. Who will? My friend Pedro. Who's he? The one in the white jersey over there. Oh. You seem to have made friends pretty quickly. We've only been in the place a couple of hours. Yes, dear. <laughs> What a wonderful experience it was for us to be there in the Spanish bodega that evening with Richard Schoen's own kith and kin. How well he had known such places himself. We could picture him on just such an evening as this, watching the life of the old Puerto and sipping a glass of the sweet, warm, local, rather heady uh, drink. How well he himself could evoke such scenes. We could never, alas, hope to emulate him. But nonetheless, as we contemplated the smiling, dusky, sun-bronzed faces of the young men and women bending over their immemorial stringed instruments, strumming ancient music from the strings on them, smiling from their sun-dusky, sun-bronzed faces as they, as, they, as, they, as they did so. Yes. Richard Schoen described this subtle music on more than one occasion. Mr. Reeve. Oh, Michelle. I, I thought you'd hurt your ankle. Oh, it's not really very bad, and I felt I had to come. Look, Mr. Reeve, I'm so sorry. You must have thought me a frightful idiot just now. Oh, but why, Miss Sherry? I really must apologise for what I said about Uncle Dick being a father figure and Miss Tablet a mother figure. Oh, no, Miss Sherry, please. I, I confess I was a little mystified. What I ought but... to have said, of course, was that it's actually Miss Tablet who's your father figure and Uncle Dick who's your mother. His novels probably reproduce archaic feeding memories for you. They represent milk. You suck them in with your eyes, so to speak. And Miss Tablet, of course, is a father figure. I ought to have seen that at once when you said music was your second love. The father always appears as a love object later than the mother, naturally. Indeed. And, of course, Miss Tablet as a father image will probably have been reinforced in the current situation by her habits of dress. Well, I have seen her wearing a, a sort of blouse once. Did your mother ever dress as a man? No, God bless my soul, no. No, your father is a woman. No, 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 no. You're quite sure? Well, yes, I, I think so. 
Well, of course, I, I can't claim to be on the carrot. <laughs> We English have the sea in our blood. That has often been said of us by friend and foe alike. And what splendid appetites it gives us. There can be no meal on earth so satisfying as a good breakfast taken on shipboard. And what I so much like about the continent's breakfast and the English breakfast is that when there is a choice, one is able to have both. First the one and then the other. Well, hurry up over it, Elsa. Some of us are on this cruise to work, not to idle. I'll see you in the music room in 15 minutes. And how is the new opera proceeding, Hilda, dear? It isn't proceeding at all as yet, Steve, dear. I can't think of a ruddy subject. Plenty of ideas for the score, of course, but nothing to drape them over. Tried one of those new plastic clothes horses, dear. Evelyn, have you finished your breakfast? Yes, dear. Then kindly go. I'm on my way. Don't forget what I said, Elsa. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. It was so kind of you to talk to Janet last night, Mr. Reeve. I, I hope she didn't say anything to you. Say anything, Mrs. Sherr? Well, I'm so worried about her. I don't wonder. Could you hush your bright Muffy? Mummy's here. I hope there's nothing wrong with Miss Sherr. No, not exactly wrong. Not exactly. Well, the girl seemed all right to me. Seemed as sound as a bell. Well, almost, I mean. What is the nature of her affliction? Well, it isn't exactly an affliction, except for the rest of us, a little, perhaps. What further degradation is about to fall on our hapless family? Is she with child? <gasps> oh, no, even dear. No, uh, it, Shall it, us, uh, uh, chaps, go away? No, no, please. Oh, you're bound to know sooner or later. Janet is psychoanalyzing herself. Good gracious. What's wrong with the poor girl? Oh, oh, nothing, nothing at all. No? I think it a so good idea. I have been psychoanalyzed myself in Vienna. What for? Anorexia nervosa. Oh, what's that? Loss of appetite. I was a martyrdom to it. Did you get it back? Not entirely, but it enabled me to hold on to my top C for longer than anybody else in Eastern Europe. Yes, I'm sure it's very nice. Oh, yes. But I didn't know anyone could psychoanalyze themselves. Professor Freud psychoanalyzed himself in 1897. And the little muffy pussy analyzed herself in 1955. And I myself have psychoanalyzed myself for the last 27 years. Yes, I know, Stephen, dear. That's what's worrying me. What? Oh, I, I, I didn't know. Oh, you may not... calumniate me as much as you wish, Nancy Showy. My deep self-knowledge enables me to take any affront with equanimity. I would like to know how else I could have acquired the fortitude that has enabled me to put up with what I've had to put up with in all these years. Anyone else in my position would have been riddled with internal persecutors, riddled with them. But my internal persecutors are all external ones, as you have only to look around you to see, and I continually turn the other cheek. Continually. Do they ever slap that one? Invariably. Oh, I say, that's rotten. Though. I'm used to it. Well, Janet's doing the same. Perhaps it runs in the family. Never. I dare say it's very modern, but some of the things she says are so very broad-minded. About me, too. Of course, I know I'm only her mother, the but Muffy I... Muffy says broad-minded things about a mummy sometimes. Who well, doesn't do Muffy? It's all very well for you to make light of it, Connie. You wouldn't joke if you heard what Janet said about you and the pussies. How dare she? What does she say about pussies? She says they're... Yeah. Out of hush, Muffy. Well... She says they're children, she thinks. But of course they're children, oh dear little pussies are. They're little kitty cats, aren't you, darling? Yes, of course you are. A hedge backward. How deep, mysterious and secretive are the workings of the human mind. We had had no idea so reserved had, had Miss Schoen been on the previous night that her interests embraced so wide a field. But was it not to be expected? It was the impulse to spiritual exploration so often encountered in the novels of her uncle, and how his fearless and questioning spirit would have approved. Yes, even on this apparently bright and carefree day, with the sea sparkling joyously around us, he would approve. 
and he would have approved of the sea also. How he would have distilled such a mid-ocean day as this with the small light waves dancing and, 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 and hopping from the horizon, to, you know, from here to the horizon with the morning sun poised questioningly over it, them, as though to ask these small light waves what they were doing, hop, hop, uh, flowing so brightly from, the, uh, from here to the horizon. Yes, by heaven, Schoen would have had the words for it. Well, I'm all for them. For whom, General Dan? The psychoanalysts. I once want to win myself. A splendid body of men. The one I went to was a woman. I went to her for about a couple of months, but somehow, after a bit, she seemed to break up. They had to put her away, poor woman. Uh, really? Why? Well, she somehow got it into her head that she was the bell song from Lacme. Strange, the deep underworkings of the mind. She wasn't, of course. Uh, no, I, I suppose not. I think I might let Janet have a go at me. Well, of course, uh, I'll have to make her promise not to stop my dream. Oh, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> Do you dream, Reeve? Not very often, no. Really? I, uh, I dream quite a bit myself. Only when I'm asleep, of course. The curious thing is, it's always the same dream. Would you believe that now? Always the same. Not that I mind, of course. I'm not one to hanker after change the whole time. No. No. Good dream it is. I'm uh, quite pleased with it, really. Well, if you really insist on knowing, it's about fireworks, actually. I see. Yes, yes. It's always bonfire night in my dream. Oh, there's lots of things going off round about, of course. Roman candles, that sort of thing. Sparklers, small stuff. <laughs> All right of its kind, but dreadfully small. <laughs> yes. Yes, there's always a lot of nice people there. Plenty of fun. Old king and queen bobbing about, of course, and so on. I've always got my tail's jacket on. Nothing else, just the jacket. And as things wear on, it's a nice long dream. Very leisurely. The sort most people don't have these days. But as things wear on, I become aware of feeling rather hot round the coat tails. And before I know where I am, I've turned into one of those spanking red rockets they have. Oh, terrific. Oh, I'm very alarming. Say? I... Uh... Yes. Yes, I'm a rocket. And suddenly, up I shoot. Right up in the air. Till eventually, I explode, don't you know? Oh, dear. Well, I say explode. I don't want to be dogmatic. It may be just the sound barrier I break through at that point. I can't tell. I lost Janet. But whatever it is, there's a whopping great bang. Supremely impressive. And, uh, and then what happens? Say... What happens next? When? After the explosion. Reeve, I like you very much personally. But what I can't stand is this eternal note of carping criticism the whole time. I told you, there's a whopping great bang. Isn't that enough? Hmm? Well, I find it enough. Why shouldn't anybody else? Say? Well, no, no, General, please don't think... No, it's the attitude of mine I don't like, Reeve. Forgive me for saying so. There seems to be no end to it. Oh, why, there she is. Hi. Uh, uh, Janet. Hello, Uncle. Uh, can you come here for a minute, my dear? OK, Uncle. Coming. And please don't start taking the rise out of poor Janet Reeve. You will not have a friend left in the world the way you're going on, by golly. Hello, Uncle Arthur. Ah, morning, Janet, my dear. Good morning, Miss Shem. Uh, Janet, uh, your mother tells us you've uh, taken to the psychoanalysis. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, Uncle. Well, I... I'm very glad. Very glad. Every girl needs a quiet indoor hobby. And as a little encouragement, Janet, I'm going to let you psychoanalyze me. There. <laughs> don't be silly, Uncle. Now, we'll start... No, to... don't talk nonsense, Uncle. I, I couldn't psychoanalyze anyone for toffee. And even if I could, it would be totally improper to try to analyze a member of one's own family. I disagree with that most emphatically, my dear. These things are like charity. They should begin at home. <laughs> now, we'll start tomorrow morning. No, Uncle, it's out of the question. Who says so? Everyone. Freud, Ferenczi, Abraham, Ernest Jones, Melanie Janet, Clark. 
You're not taking any notice of what a crowd of foreigners say, I hope and trust. Uncle. Oh, go on, Janet. Go on, go on. Don't be a small sport. And I'll buy you a wacky great box of chocolates for your birthday. No, Uncle. Very well, Janet. I shall speak to your mother about this. I've been very patient, Janet. And I won't stand in subordination. Good morning to you. Dreadful prospect we all face if this is allowed to go on. <laughs> Dear old uncle. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, terrible old narcissus, of course. Uh, did I hear him say you had a birthday, Bishop? Yes, end of next week. 22. Oh, a beautiful age. So people say. Gives me hell sometimes. Oh, I, I do hope not, Janet. Uh, uh, Miss Sherwin. No, no, no. Please call me Janet. I can't bear Miss Sherwin. Reluctance to grow up, I suppose. Thank you, Janet. I do hope you will reciprocate by... Thank you. Oh. I'll call you Bertie, shall I? Oh, no, no, Janet, please, for God's sake. Herbert. Please call me Herbert. But Miss Tablet always calls you Bertie. Yes, yes, I'm afraid she does. But you resent it, obviously. Well, not resent, actually, but... I expect you feel that she's split off a part of you. Uh, and uh, Janet... It. Yes, I... Herty? Um, Burb? Um, Herbert? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it was just that there's a ping-pong table in the billiard room, and I thought we might play a game of ping-pong on it. I'd love to. Yes, let's. It'll help to, to work off our aggression. Come on. Well, I, I don't play a very aggressive game, I, I'm afraid. Oh, that's okay. Come on. The still admirable third program has suffered rude mutilation in recent times, a point we shall return to later. At the moment, we must content ourselves with observing that, that that is the reason we cannot give any very full account of all the delightful places we visited on our voyage. Nice, Portofino, Lerici, Naples, dear, dear Naples. We could say how much, how very much of them. But we feel we must concentrate on our own friendly adventurers. Our life was by no means all play. We ourselves had our two biographies to, uh, to ponder on. Uh, Hilda had her opera, whose gestation she would frequently enlighten us about. been in such a hell of a sweat over anything. I can't get the ruddy thing to move. No, no, no. Well, it sounds beautifully loud. Oh, it is, I grant you. And what there is of it's good. Well, listen. But it's the subject of the thing that I still can't get. I am always yours to command, Miss Tablet. Well, I've already commanded you. Think me up a good, heroic, classical subject. Damn it, you're a classical scholar, General. Uh, yes, yes. Have you ever thought of Robin Hood? Never, General. And the subject had to be classical. Hellenic. Yes, of course. Uh, how about Julius Caesar? No, General, dear. Greek. Uh, Greek? Ah, oh, yes, yes, Greek. Well, Miss Tablet, I am ever yours to command. And the minute I think of anything, I shall... Lay it at your feet. Nor were others less creative. Our young friend Owen Schoen, Janet's brother, was to find, as who has not, fresh inspiration in the waters, the skies, and the shores of fair Italy, that admirable land. Well, of course, you'll understand that this is still in rather an experimental state at the moment, Mr. Reed. So is the lyric, of course. Uh, yes, yes, of course. I mean, this is all a big new experience to us. You feel you have to absorb new sensations yes, yes, indeed, yes. and new techniques. So if this piece does sound rather sort of revolutionary, you'll be a bit patient with us, I'm sure. You will, won't you, Mr. Reed? Oh, by all means, my dear fellow. Uh, it's a little number called Speriano. It means, here's hoping. You come and slap the piano, Brian. Uh, OK. I I'll take the tambo. Yeah. I'm afraid it's also a bit experimental in, in language as well, Mr. Reed. But anyway, you'll see. Under the moon in the sweet scented pond it was summer and soon you lay in my arms and murmured so gently those sweet foreign words they sounded to me like the song of the birds hasta la vista you said je vous I don't know the meaning, but I loved you the same. 
Vive la lira, you said, si vous plaît. And I knew there was something stood in our way. Yes, something was wrong then between you and I. And oh, I could see from the look in your eye that our river dirty meant goodbye. Mr. Reeve, it's all rather fragmentary at the moment. We haven't even worked the title in yet, Mr. Reeve. It will scarcely be denied that the still admirable third programme has been rudely abbreviated of late, a point to which we must later revert. We mention the fact here merely that we may be forgiven for saying almost nothing of the ship's company. Nevertheless, a ship, be she the veriest sloop, scow, yawl, smack or lugger, is as naught without her captain. The master of the Jocasta was Captain Smithers, always approachable and often approached. We all of us respected, nay, revered the man. General Gland, in particular, had that almost shy adoration for him so often found among army men in their contacts with the Navy. Uh, evening, Captain Smithers. Evening, General Gland. Nice night. Yes, very, very clear. Calm, yes, very calm. Yes, it is. I expect you uh, like it calm, Captain. Yes, nice calm night. Peaceful. Yes. Uh, a storm might blow up. Oh, no, 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 no. Impossible this time of year. Oh. Ever, uh, ever been in a storm, Captain Smith? God, yes. Hundreds. Where? Everywhere. Oh. Ever been off Kamchatka in winter? No, can't say I have. You? Uh, no, uh, no, uh, not exactly, no. No, bad spot, best avoided. Worst spot in the world, probably. Well, uh, have you ever been in a jungle, for example, Captain Smithers? No, never. Thought not. Have you ever seen a jungle? Only from a distance, of course. Where? Off Sumatra, in 37. Yes, ah, oh, yes, well, you might call that a jungle, I suppose. Dreadfully small one, of course. Still, I expect you were wise to steer clear of it. Yes, yes. Ah, listen, the young people, singing. Yes, progressive jazz. Dreadful. Oh, come, come, come. I expect they enjoy it. Ah, they may think they do, but it's a sign of the times, Smithers. I don't like it. No? No, I don't like what it portends. Well... Just listen to him. Yes, by golly, Smithers, it's an angry generation. Angry? What about? They don't know, Smithers. That's the trouble. They don't know. No? No. But they're not pleased, Smithers. Oh, no? No. Not pleased with us and not pleased with themselves and not pleased with the world. Dissatisfied. I suppose so. Yes. Angry. I'm not afraid to say so. No. Not afraid to speak out. Crisp, modern dialogue. Yes. Yes. All the same, I'll make young Janet psychoanalyze me if I have to swing for it. What's that? Crisp. Yes. Have you ever shot an albatross, Captain Smith? Good God, no. Why not? Cruelty to animals. Can't stomach it. Beastly. An albatross isn't an animal, Captain Smithers. It's what's known as a bird. Same thing, same sort of cruelty. Abominated. Same as rhino hunting. Ah. Well, I've never met anyone before who thought an animal was the same as a bird. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, bless my soul. Listen to that now. Ah, Smithers. They've tired of the old shibboleths. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Tired of them? Yes. Think they're exploded? Yes. Outdated, exploded. Sick of the old shibboleths. Do you... Uh, do you remember any of the old shibboleths, Captain Shivers? No, can't say I do. Not offhand. No, nor me. Pity. There must have been some, sometime, I suppose. 
Well, General, I must turn in. Yes, oh yes, yes, you do. You turn in. It's uh, it's quite calm. Oh, and thanks for the chat. Thank you, sir. Good night, General. Uh, oh, uh, just one thing, Captain Smithers. Yes, General. Have you uh, have you ever seen a white whale, Captain Smithers? Uh, <laughs> never, my dear fellow. Never. There's no such thing. What? Uh, somebody has obviously been trying to scare you, General. Just don't let yourself get jumpy. That's all. Good night to you. God bless my. Dear. Uh, good night, Captain Shibboleth. God help us. Listen to them. Where is it all leading to? It is perhaps a strange feeling to be a guest aboard a ship and yet never to see one's host. But Mr. Aphanisis himself, our kindly benefactor and Hilda's new patron, had still not appeared. Indeed, Hilda had assured us that we might not see him at all before we arrived in Greek waters, if then. Nevertheless, one evening, as some of us were sitting chatting in our deck chairs under the jib boom, with the brilliant moon almost overhead in the soft, almost palpable sky. But I tried my best with her, Arthur. Janet's a bad, wicked girl, Nancy, and bad will become of her. I do see your point, Arthur, dear, but then I do see Janet's point, too. Don't you, Mr. Reeve? Uh, yes, uh, and yes. Fancy refusing her poor old uncle a simple little thing like that. It galls me. Uh, and stop fidgeting, Reeve. I've told you before. Oh, Psychoanalysis is never simple, Arthur. Though I'm sure you would derive great benefit from it. As you have, Stephen, dear. As I have, Hilda, dear. And as a Muffy has. I don't know Muffy. I promised her a great box of chocolates. Our family has frequently been offered bribes. Good Lord, look there. Uh, where? Up on the bridge with Captain Smithers. Can you see? Who is it, dear? Our host. Aeschylus Saphonisis. Ooh, keep quite quiet, Muffy. A striking figure. Yes. Very striking and impressive. Yes. Very remote. Shrouded in a golden enigma, yes. as you might almost say. Thank you. Inscrutable. Like Captain Ahab in Moby Dick. Well, apart from the extra leg, of course. Father, he's going below. Oh, dear. Well, shame. that was your new patron, Hilda, dear. That was my new patron, Stephen, dear. Gone below. Pity. Only old Smithers there now. What a charming man Captain Smithers is. Yes. Interesting mind, too. Thinks a rhinoceros can fly. Thinks it can what? Fly. A deep-rooted obsession with the man, in a very real sense. I wanted to ask Janet about it. To approach the magical city of Venice from the sea is the experience of a lifetime. Even on a third program so rudely stunted, a point to which we must shortly return, we feel compelled to linger a while over the magic of that sea-girt city. How many pens have evoked and preserved her for us? And none more certainly than that of Richard Schoen. How deeply the Queen of the Adriatic had entered his lofty spirit. And whose indeed would she not? Even now, as we contemplated the blue waters of the incomparable lagoon flowing from the church of Santa Maria de la Salute along the esplanade, uh, the, the front, uh, that part of the sea girt city that faces the sea, uh, the water of the blue lagoon lapping and flowing as far as the Santa, uh, the, uh, the church at the other end. There was something about her that would have inspired even the most sluggish pen. It's heavenly, isn't it? Especially from the sea. Incomparable. What a lovely colour on the Doge's palace, especially at this time of day. You know, I never see it without thinking of... I know. Uh, Part two, chapter seven of The Bang and the Whimper by my late respected uncle. Oh, Janet. Well, if you can take that, you can take anything. I know there have been one or two rather malicious parodies of it, but... Oh, no, Janet. It's incomparable. That I do grant. Uh, oh, Janet. Herbert, you do know about idealization, I suppose. Uh, idealization? Idealization is the result of excessive splitting of the superego. It goes very deep. It's one of the root causes of schizophrenia. Well, <laughs> let's hope I don't develop that, Janet. Let's hope not. 
Oh, Lord. Uh, Uncle Arthur's coming this way. Do tell him I've gone to change, will you? See you later. Was that Janet you were talking to, Reeve? Uh, yes, General. Ah, uh, she's a bad, wicked girl, Reeve. I shan't give her a birthday present tomorrow. Oh, yes, of course, it's tomorrow. I would have given her a large box of chocolates if she'd only consented to psychoanalyze her poor old uncle. Yeah. No, I shan't even wish her many happy returns. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, General. Yeah. Have you ever been to Bangkok, Reeve? No, General, never. They call it the Venice of the East. Did you know that? No, I don't think I did. I expect they call this the Bangkok of the West. Well, must do, of course, must do. Stands to sense. Beautiful place, remarkable. Oh, incomparable. Some very fine jungles in the hinterland. I used to take Sister Martin and the two nurses out there in a the rickshaw on Sundays. And we used to get lost sometimes. Still, there's always plenty to do in the jungle. Oh, just listen to those lovely bells. As we wandered about the enchanted Seagirt city, observing the ever-moving motley crowd in the vast piazza, or admiring the glitter and flash of the antique shops in the narrow, crowded Cali, it crossed our thoughts how often, with his superb, unfailing eye for detail, his immediate and immense capacity for entering into the foreign scene, how often, how very, very, very often, Bloody old Richard Showin must have gone mousing around. What had we just heard ourselves say to ourselves? How often blood? No. No. It must have been some other voice. Such things do happen. Voices are heard. Some, some trick of the heat working on the overtired brain can at times, it has been well said, produce extraordinary feelings of the most shameful and degrading disloyalty towards people and objects we normally venerate. Perhaps our brain was a little overtired. Who could say? Uh, perhaps we ought to, to sit down. We, we sat down. We sat down and began to collect our thoughts. Prego, sir. Oh, uh... Un tazza di tè, se vous plaît, uh, per favore. China or Indian tea, sir? Uh, Indian, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, grazie. Subito, signor. Hello. Oh, oh, hello, Evelyn. Hello. I, I didn't see you. Saw you, though. Yes. Have, have you been exploring? Been for a little walk with my friend Nino. Uh, can I come and sit down? Yes, yes, please do. I didn't know you had friends in Venice, Evelyn. It's the one over there, the one in the white T-shirt. Like to meet you. Oh, no, well, I, I'm just about to do a little hurried shopping. Okay, Evelyn. so am I. Ecco il te, signore. Oh, gra grazie. Prego, signore. What are you going to buy, Mr. Reeve? Well, I have to try and buy a sort of bangle bracelet. Oh, jolly pretty. Which wrist are you going to wear it on, Mr. Reeve? Well, huh? oh, oh, <laughs> no, it's not for myself, Evelyn. Oh, who's it for, then? Oh, no one in, in particular? I bet. Uh, Jolly nice place, Venice, isn't it? Oh, it's uh, incomparable. What's that tower in the corner, Mr. Reeve? Uh, it's the Tower of St. Mark's. Why does it look so new, Mr. Reeve? Well, actually, it is fairly new. It was built about 50 years ago to replace the old one. Why, did the old one get worn out? No, Evelyn, it suddenly collapsed one day into the square. Gosh, were lots of people killed? No, the marvellous thing was it killed nobody at all. Everyone was in church at the time. Jolly lucky. Everybody. Uh, well... It's rather odd you should ask, because as a matter of fact, there was one person who saw it collapse, and, and, and that was Mr. Richard Showin, the subject of my biography. And he actually saw the tower fall down? Yes, Evelyn. He saw it fall. You mustn't say that, Evelyn. Say what, Mr. Reeve? What you just said. But I didn't say anything, Mr. Reeve. Huh? Are you sure, Evelyn? Of course. Oh, well, I'm... I'm terribly sorry, Evelyn. Please, please don't be hurt. What did you think I said, Mr. Reeve? Well, it's very silly, but I... I made sure I heard you say... A pity it didn't hit him. Well, it's, it's very close today, don't you think, Evelyn? Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! 
Happy birthday, dear Janet. Happy birthday to you. Hey, good old Janet. Oh, Janet. Oh, Janet. 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 No, oh. no, I'm jolly well not going to make a speech. Oh, no, and you no, jolly well no. know it. Well, but jolly well off. Thank you. No, I'm not. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for all the lovely presents you've given me. Oh, I adore you. getting birthday presents. <laughs> well, we all do, of course. Oh, no. I mean, if, if, if one doesn't get birthday presents, it can remobilize very painfully the persecutory anxiety which usually follows birth. Oh. Janet, dear, not on your birthday. So thank you again, everybody, very much. I feel very... Very happy and full of good objects. Hooray for Janet! It was so kind of you to give Janet that beautiful bracelet, Mr. Reed. Just a small token. Janet. Oh, Uncle Arthur. Uh, I'm sorry I was not here for the official ceremony, Janet. Well, it wasn't exactly an official... And I know that you're not very fond of your old Uncle Arthur these days, my dear. But I trust you'll not be offended if in wishing you many happy returns of the day, I offer you this small token of my esteem. Uncle, darling, thank you. It's enormous. It's the largest box of chocolates in Venice. It's wonderful, Uncle Arthur. I must give you a big kiss for it. Mm. Uh, well, I'm very sorry if it offends you, Janet. Don't be a great silly, Uncle, dear. Offend me, indeed. Can I open it now? Only if you don't think it offensive of me, Janet, dear. Uncle Darling. Morning, Reeve. Uh, good morning, sir. Have you any uncles, Reeve? Oh, yes, yes, indeed, several. Old ones? Fairly old, yes. Have you ever refused to psychoanalyze any of the poor old things, Reeve? Well, uh, none of them has ever actually approached me with a Ah, Reeve, my dear fellow. It's a very sad day for an uncle when that happens. Uncle? Well, I've no wish to disturb this happy gathering. Uncle Arthur, I... Yes, Janet? I... Well... Well, Uncle, I don't really know anything about the subject, but I could give you an association test. Will that psychoanalyze me? Well, it's still used, I think, sometimes, as a sort of beginning. Well, that's quite good enough for your poor old uncle, my dear. Good. <laughs> now then, when do we start? Just give me an idea of the rule. Well, I, I simply say a word. A word, yes. And, and, and you just... Well, you just say the first thing it suggests to you. Good, splendid. I can do that. Oh, all right. Now, I'll stand over here, and you stand there. Oh, and you can stand there, Reeve, and act as referee. Uh, well, uh, Uncle, there's no... Uh, no, no, not there, Reeve. Two short paces to the left. That's right. Now, don't slouch, man. Shoulders back. That's right. Stomach well in. Ah, that's better. Now then, Janet, are you set? Yes, Uncle. Right. Ready, steady, off. Uh, um... Well, come on, Janet, I'm all set. Um, mother. Father. Brother. Sister. Blue. Blood. Uh, cat. Mint. Plate. Teeth. Glass. Teeth again. I like this. Go on. Watch. Out. Bottom. Note. Ah, uh, that got you. <laughs> Go on. Uh, dog. Um, oh, teeth again, obviously. Foot. Flat. White. Teeth. Girl. Another girl. Back. Teeth. Uh, red. Nasturtiums. Go on. Yellow. Teeth. Front. Teeth. Horse. Voice. What? Not. No, Uncle. Yes, Aunt. Go on. Um, tea. Uh, the tea on a golf course or the, 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 the sort you drink? Uh, it doesn't matter. Well, of course it matters, girl. Supreme difference. Um, all right. All right, then the tea you drink. Um, caddy. Go on. Uh, bell. Half a mole. Let's think. Uh... Bell. Yeah, no, sorry. Can't do that one. That's one to you. Go on. No, I can wait. Bell. No, 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 no. Skip that one. Go on. Bell. Bell. Janet, 
I don't want to have to speak to your mother about oh, this. Oh, all right, then. We'll pass on. I should think so. Mouth. Teeth. Eye. Teeth. Cow. Hilda. No, 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 no. No, no, no don't, don't put that down. The accident slipped out. Very naughty. Uh, gold. Tooth. Boy. Girl. Teeth. Out. Uh, yes, uh, I think that'll do to go on with, Uncle. Jolly splendid. <laughs> how many did I get? Get? Yes, how many marks? But, Uncle, this isn't a game. Well, I know it isn't, my dear, but you must have marks, otherwise... It depends entirely on what you've been up to of late, Mr. Reeve. Well, I've nothing against you personally, Reeve, and I hope I shan't have cause to. I have. I, I think I'd better go straight away. <laughs> Excuse me. Tell me, Hilda, dear... Have you ever read the passages about social climbing in the work of Marcel Proust? It was with considerable trepidation that we approached the forbidden territory in which Mr. Athanasius held his domain. We rather wished we'd been a little more formally dressed, but the instruction in seven minutes' time had not seemed to permit of interpretative latitude. Mr. Reeve is here, sir. Sick. Thank you, sir. Sit. Mister. You ever been to a place called the British Museum? Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Many times. So have I. You, you enjoyed it, I hope, sir? Enjoyed it? Mister. For God's sake. <laughs> Bear with me, mister, please. I'm terribly sorry, sir. Is there anything I, I can do? <laughs> Listen, mister. I love the English. I've always loved them. I love you, too. I'm Greek. I got the Greek spirit. I've imbibed the Greek experience. Nobody could be Greeker than I am. Sometimes when we're cruising through the islands, I could cry like a baby at the sight of them. I'm that Greek. And I love the English. Who owns it? And uh, what, Mr. Hathenas? That British Museum. Well, I don't think that... Who manages it? I've got his name someplace here. I don't think I quite, quite remember. I'll break him. Break? I shall have to. It's only right. I'll ruin him. I'll fix that dead man. So I'll be glad to beg a nickel for a hamburger in Park Lanes. I want them. I sent him cables. I must have them. I ought to have them. Uh, the Elgin marbles. The, the Elgin? I offered him two million for them coal. I know what things are worth. I wasn't asking for nothing on the cheap, was I? I know, they're valuable, but everything's got its price. I've got the price on me. Delgan marbles. You mean you tried to but buy the... Of course I have. The Greek government would be delighted, mister, delighted. Oh, I see, sir. Yes, it's a splendid idea, one which many people cherish, to, to see the Elgin marbles... Oh, the Greek government wouldn't stand out a couple of days against me. I know they wouldn't. And if I can tell them I've got the London lot, they can't refuse to sell me the others. I'd like to see him go and try. Oh, I... I got the place for them, mister. Ready. I flower the keys. I bought flower the keys. Look, mister. I love the English. I love you. But I'll fix that bad man. He's trying to break my heart. I'm getting old, mister. A man wants his little collection around him when he gets old. He wants him so he can see him, all in the same place. I've got the place. A flower of the keys for me Picassos and me Matisse's and me Gainsborough's and me little coronation mug. It's just the place. Sound all the year round. People that come from far and near to see him. I wouldn't let them in, but they'd come. I could guarantee it. I feel terrible, mister. Oh, sir, I... I it's the penalty of riches, mister. People cheat you right and left. I bought sculptures all over the world. Commissioned them. Picasso, Matisse, Gainsborough. Commissioned. And what do they do? They try to cheat me. Do you know a sculpture guy by the name of Henry Moore? Oh, yes, I have a very great admiration. So had I. I commissioned the damn greatest carving in the world from him. Henry Moore. In granite. I paid for it to be sent out all the way to Florida Keys. I sent it back. I sent it back, mister. Why, sir? There was a damn great hole in it. He thought I wouldn't notice. He thought I'd be too busy. 
I'll break him too. <laughs> oh, mister, you could have driven a couple of horses through that goddamn hole. I, I'm very sorry, sir. Never mind. You're the one. I knew the minute I set eyes on you. The, the one? I, I love the English. I love them all. I like the way they look at you. Oh, yes. And I love you. And you'll do it. I know you will. Well, sir, if I, I can be of any help... Thank I... you, mister. Elgin Marbles. There's only one thing I don't want. I don't want you should use the knife. The, the knife? Sir? No. It's dirty. You use the powders. Powders, sir? I shan't give them to you till the end of the trip. That wouldn't be right. Three of them, I'll give you three. They'll never fail. Fail? The minute we get back to Gibraltar, you'll fly to London in one of my planes. You'll invite Mr. Henry Moore and the British Museum guy, either together or separately, to afternoon tea. <laughs> the powders are tasteless in tea. There's one for each of them. The third is for yourself. For myself? Oh, it's a present. You never know when it might come in handy. We all have our enemies. It's terrible, but we do. But, 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 but Mr. Aphanasius... Decency, I... mister. That's what I like about you. I love you. I know you love me, too. The consequences of our interesting interview with Mr. Aphanasius were indeed uh, strange and far-reaching. Uh, yes. Uh, alas, that the rude sharing of the third program in recent times should entirely preclude further reference to them. Uh, Greece must be our theme. How happily we lingered in the blue Aegean waters. What pen could convey the charm of those island nocturnes? The Greek taverna, with its dancers moving slowly and gracefully on their shapely legs to the ancient evocative music that seemed to impel the dancers to move their legs in, in time to it. Uh, their shapeful swinging garments revealing to the full the, uh, in, in the taverna. Uh, the beautiful movement of their legs as they weaved in and out of the dance on their... Uh, in the uh, taverna. Magnificent, isn't it? Disturbing in some strange way. A sort of primitive arcade quality about it. About what, Miss Stubblet? This dancing. Oh, if you can call it dancing, Miss Stubblet. Well, damn it, it is dancing. No, no, not really. General Glenn, this dance is absolutely authentic. Oh, no, no. It's just a debased copy of the thing Sister Martin and the two nurses used to do in the jungle on that afternoon off. A Thursday, usually. Well, really, General, you seem to have been very lucky in that jungle of yours. Oh, I was, Miss Tablet, very. I should so like the dance routine in my next opera to have some such motion as this. Is. Well, dear, if any of these bright boys ever so much as suggest a ruddy subject for a girl... I am ever yours to command. And Athens herself, the goal of every traveller with Western culture in his heart. How fortunate we were to have a soldier scholar for our guide, one who could disentangle the romance from the grim reality in the classic past. This, my friends, is the Parthenia. Breadful state of disrepair, it's end, of course, but let us all hope, and fervently, that time, the great healer, will one day see it restored to its former glory. Don't finger it, Reeve. I've told you before. That's the way it's got the way it is. Well, General, I, I was only... And to... let's not brawl in public, Reeve. Sorry. Not at all. Now, if you'll all look up there, you'll see the remains of what is called a three. Very casual, of course, the way it's been left there. Just a few chaps' legs and some horses' heads. But let us all hope, and fervently, that if ever the world enjoys settled peace once more, they will all be returned to their original place in the British Museum. Oh, I say, General, damn that for a game. Exactly, Miss Tablet. And now, turning southwards, the harbour of the Pyria, together with a magnificent spectacle of sea and sky, can be seen out yonder just behind my sister-in-law. Oh, I'm so sorry. I always get in the way. So stupid of me. Oh! Oh, dear. I'm so sorry. Could someone help me up, please? I seem to have slipped. Oh, my oh, goodness. Thank you so much. Oh, what a beautiful sight. It makes me wish to sing it. Well, the 
do you mind? I shall go back. You uh, were saying, General? It was here on that fateful day centuries ago that the Trojan fleet, a thousand strong, landed their forces for the great war of Troy. No, they didn't, Arthur. Yes, they did, Stephen. Here, the great war of Troy commenced. Even to us today, with the experience of global war behind us. And before us, Arthur. And behind us, Stephen. We can have no conception of what the Trojan War meant to the ancient world. It lasted exactly a hundred years. And very few of the people who were in in the beginning managed to get out at the end. It's been so in many wars. No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. It was during the Trojan War that one of the most noble efforts at restoring peace that have ever been made was made. I refer, of course, to the bold action taken by the Greek heroine Lysistrata and the women of Athens, as recounted in the celebrated comedy by Aristophanes. A work of double significance to us today, inasmuch as we enacted it on VJ Day in the officers' mess in Wrangell. I took off the part of Lysistrata myself. It was an all-male cast, naturally, in an officer's mess. The few men's parts were lightly sketched in by Sister Martin and the two nurses. To the best of my recollection, it is the only occasion on which I've ever shaved my chest. Uh, the moustache, of course, I was allowed to keep because of the victory parade the next day. But I don't think anybody in the audience noticed it. Heaven and earth! You spoke, Miss Dublin? My subject. Yes, Miss Dublin? Why in the Lord's name did I never think of it before? The Lysistrata, of course! Oh, why, it's a perfect subject for me. Perfect! It'll be better than butter, even. God bless you, General. An angel alighted on your tongue this afternoon. Posterity really? will remember you for it. Uh, yours ever to command, Miss Dublin. Bertie. Yes, Hilda? The minute you could get back to the yacht, be sure and make the exactest possible note of this occasion for the biography. Give full credit to General Gland and make a complete list of all the people who were present. Uh, yes, Hilda. Together with their reactions. Yes, Hilda. Come on, Elsa. Back to work. What a magnificent occasion. Hello. Hello. Where have you been? Been for a little walk. Who with? My friend Spira. Who's he? The one over there in the white jersey. Well, my lad, you missed the experience of a lifetime this afternoon. Oh, no, I didn't, dear. Come on, Elsa. And God bless you, General Bland. Oh, I am already so exhausted. And I'm feeling so much the need of some tea and toast. Well, of course, I may find it a trifle difficult to actually sing the role. Still, one can but try one's best. Of course, dear. Well... Uh, no, Janet, please. You will remember that you have to record everyone's reactions to the great annunciation, won't you? Oh, yes, Janet. You'll be able to say that the moment Hilda vanished towards the city, Janet Schoen, the famous novelist's niece, asked with marked curiosity, Mr. Reed... Uh, uh, Janet, do, 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 do you, be careful. Do you ever have fantasies about Miss Tablet in which you imagine you are cutting or tearing her to pieces, gouging her, scooping her out, roasting her? or stuffing bad ashes into her. Well, not, not scooping her out, Janet. Certainly not that way. Very good friends, of course. Do you dream about her? Well, just as friends, you know. Does the thought of eating her repel you? Well, it, it's not a thing I've so far given much thought to, Janet. Or do you ever feel that she has eaten you? Well, it's interesting you should mention that, because last Wednesday afternoon I did have rather... That's all so far, Mr. Aphrodisus. <laughs> just the opening bars, you understand. You've written all that? In just these five or six weeks? That's so, Mr. Aphrodisus. It's, it's been coming along. It's a miracle. You're not rushing ahead too fast with it, are you? I don't want you to be scamped. Oh, I think I can promise that. Oh, I wish you could be solid, so I could hold it in my arms, like my Picasso's and my Matisse's. It would be pretty solid. I want it all written on my yacht. And all mine. I want you to be surrounded by everything you need. Your friends, all the time, whenever you want them. Tell them all to make arrangements to stay on the yacht for the next two years. 
circulate that in the form of a memo, Blanca, to everyone on board. Hello, Herbert. Oh, hello, Janet. What's the matter? You look rather in the depressive position this morning. Well, perhaps I am a little, Janet. Oh, it's quite healthy, of course. Is it? Yes. You see, Janet, I, uh, I just made a great decision, uh, I think. What is it? It's about Hilda. Are you going to tell her to go to hell? Good heavens, no, Janet. I, I'm very fond of her. I merely intend to ask her if she could possibly see her way you to... tell to her, her, but don't ask. Just tell her. Not that it's my business, of course. It's going to be very painful. Oh, oh, oh good morning, General. Morning, Reeve. Hello, Unc. Morning. Sorry I'm not at liberty to stay and converse. Very, very busy. Much preoccupied. With what, Uncle? Uh, no, 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 Janet. I'm sorry, but I have no time for the psychoanalyzing this morning. Very busy. Much preoccupied. Oh, sorry, Uncle. Well, no matter. You shall have your chocolates just the same. Excuse me. You were saying, Herbert, it would be painful, very... Painful, painful, Janet. Painful slip. It must be faced. I, I, I must face it. When? Oh, I hadn't exactly thought when. Uh, uh, tomorrow, perhaps, or, or Sunday. Compulsive postponement. Hello. Oh, oh hello. Hello. Evening. hello. I got a message for you, Mr. Reeve, from old Hilda. Wants to see you straight away on the poop deck. Oh. Well, thank you, Evelyn. Shall I go away now? Well, just as you like, Evelyn. I'm on my way. Well, I ought to be on mine, too, I suppose, and see what she wants. Yes, Herbert. Good of Janet. There is one thing I wanted to tell you. It... It was about the first time I came down to Malsett. I expect you've forgotten, Bertie, but... Bertie, where are you? Oh, please, e excuse me a moment. Of course, Bertie. Bertie! Uh, I, I'm here, Hilda. I'm, I'm just coming. Here, Hilda? Ah, Bertie, I, I wanted to talk to you. Rather seriously, Bertie. Y yes, Hilda? As you know, Bertie, I've had very little to crow about in my life. No, no advantages to speak of. Little happiness, no great experiences. It's been different with you, Bertie. You've always been lucky. Oh, I sometimes wonder how anyone can imagine that, Hilda. Bertie, damn it. Bertie, that's a bit ungrateful, isn't it? How, Hilda? Well, damn it. Bertie, you've known me for several years. Well. Don't estimate that so ruddy lightly, old cock. Uh, no, no, Hilda, I, I won't. Oh, it's been different with me. I've had nothing like that at all. No one has ever said to me the sort of things I've said to you, Bertie. Uh, no. No one. And that's what I wanted to talk about. Somehow I'm beginning to believe the luck in this world ought to be a bit better shared out than it is. Yes, Hilda. And for several years past, as I say, you have been able to, to sit wallowing luxuriously in this biography of my humble self you've been working on. Oh, I know you've not begun it yet. In a way, that makes what I have to say a little easier. What, what is it, Hilda? Oh, you, you saw what happened at the Acropolis the other afternoon? How old Arthur Glenn suddenly gave me my subject? I was deeply moved, Bertie. You see, he, like me, is another chap who's not had much luck in his life, poor old thing. No. And I'm grateful to him, and I want to do what I can for him in return. So, though I know this is going to hurt, Bertie... I'm going to take my life out of your hands and put it in those of Arthur Glenn. He's going to write it, you mean? He is, Bertie. Uh oh Take it like a man, Bertie, with your chin up. And for God's sake, don't cry, will you? I hate to see a man cry. No, I, I, I'll try not to, Hilda. Huh, good. <laughs> it's not been an easy thing to say to you. I know you're a scholar, Bertie, and a very fine one. But General Bland is a soldier scholar. And I somehow feel that's tremendously important in my case. Yes, sir. May I say, Hilda, that I wish him well? I like you for saying that, Bertie. And oh, damn it, Bertie. We've had the hell of a lot of good times together, haven't we? Oh, very, Hilda. And shall uh, again. Okay, Bertie. That's all, and thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Hilda. And we shall see each other at dinner, eh? I wanted to say, Janet, was about the occasion of my first visit to Mulsett. To me, it but was what a, about Hilda? a wonderful experience. Uh, wh what? What did Hilda say? Oh, oh, oh that's perfectly all right. I, I needn't bother about it anymore. It, it was a wonderful experience to be on your uncle's native heath for the first time, to, to breathe his air, to, to, to see the sights he knew so well. What about Hilda's biography? Well, we came to an agreement about that. I, I'm to give it up. 
Everything about that first visit is wonderfully distinct to me still, Janet. But wasn't Hilda terribly angry? I know you and I had many interesting conversations about... Hmm? No, no, I honestly don't think she minded about literature. But for me, there was one thing that transcended even literature. It was the first time I saw you. But does this mean you don't have to write the biography at all? No, there was no difficulty, none, whatever. It, it was the first time I saw you. Uh, you didn't see me, I'm afraid. But you were with the others in the meadow at the back of the house. It, it was... It, it was something you called out. What was it? Well, it wasn't so much what it was. Uh, though it was very appropriate to the moment, of course. It, it was the way you said it. There was something about it... Oh, you... You won't laugh at me, will you, Janet? Of course not. There was something about it... Oh, so young and heroic and ardent. Janet, you threw back your head, I remember, and cried out, simply cried out, Come on, Humphrey, bowl. Oh, Janet. But Humphrey was too small to bowl. It somehow didn't stop you saying it, Janet. It, it was magnificent. When I think back on that moment, Janet, I realise that I've always loved you as I shall never love anyone else. I've always hoped that one day you might be my wife. Herbert. For on that day, Janet, my darling, you were magnificence itself. No, Herbert. I wasn't. Oh, yes, Janet. You're so honest, Herbert. You make me feel such an awful fake. Fake, Janet? You're so sweet and noble, Herbert. And of course, I'll be delighted and honoured to marry you. Oh, I love you more than I'd ever loved anyone, but you say I didn't see you when I shouted, come on, Humphrey Bowl, but I... I did. I saw you standing by the stile there and watching us. I knew you were there. Oh, Janet, my darling. I knew you were watching. It's my beastly exhibitionism the whole time. You... You... Yes, my sweet. You read through sadism the whole bloody time. Oh, my only one. <laughs> no, no. Oh. I'm awfully sorry. Oh, no, no. Love, art, scholarship, the classical heritage. There must surely be a place, a brief moment to honour these, even on a third programme that has recently been, as our dear, dear Janet would say, so rudely castrated. What more can we ourselves do but recall the warm, friendly moments that attended the announcement on shipboard of our engagement? Yes, well, I've no objection at all. Highly delighted in a very real sense. Congratulations, Reed. I've never had much against you personally, and I'm very glad to think that after being friends so long, we shall also be relations. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. It uh, won't be blood relations, will it? Uh, no, sir, no. No? Oh, well, uh, there's that about it, then. Uh, and in any case, blood relation or not, you have the advantage of knowing, Mr. Reeve, that Janet will eventually inherit the house in Maltit, and a very large part, uh, and a very large part of her late uncle's so-called literary estate. Stephen, well, I, dear. I, I didn't know that, Mr. Shaw, no. Oh, I am sure you will have the spirit not to let the thought embitter you, Mr. Reeve. No, never become embittered, Reeve, whatever happens. And your little pussy so delighted, Mr. Reeve. Oh, thank you, I'm so glad. <laughs> the important thing is to see that there are bells at the wedding. I often attribute much of my own marital misfortune to the absence of those. But you were never married, Arthur, dear. Well, you could never be sure with Sister Martin and the two nurses about the place. I remember one Saturday night... Dear, and... dear, Bertie, this is splendid. Yes. Give us a kiss. Uh, mm. <laughs> oh, thank you, Hilda. And mind you, I've always had my doubts about these marriages on the rebound. But you're lucky, Herbert. You've always been lucky. And I shall certainly write the anthem for the wedding, I can promise that. Thank you, Hilda. And I shall sing it, Mr. Reeve. <laughs> and Mr. Reeve, I should so like to call you Herb. Oh, please, Elsa. <laughs> hello. Oh, hello, Evelyn. Hello. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. What are you going to wear at the wedding, Mr. Reeve? Mm, well, like a morning suit, I, I expect. Oh, jolly pretty, Mr. Reeve. I, I think you ought to call me Herbert, too, after all these years, Evelyn. No, Mr. Reeve. 
It's too late now. Well, I... Go on, I mean, you ask him. Go on. <coughs> You're the eldest. Um, uh, Mr. Reeve, uh, my brothers and I do wish to congratulate you very much. We've always been very fond of Sister Janet, and we're very glad to think of you marrying her. Oh, We've always sort of hoped you would. And, and my brothers and I would consider it a great honor if you would accept a new little number, which my brothers and I have specially written for this occasion. Oh, my dear fellows, thank you enormously. Uh, and also, Mr. Reeve, now that you're marrying Sister Janet, my brothers and I have asked me to ask if you think we might begin to use your Christian name. My dear, dear fellows, please, I don't know why you didn't ages ago. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bert. Bert. Hmm? The song is called English Lane, and it, it sort of goes like this. There's many a place for a honeymoon tour, from Venice and Rome to Rocamadour. There's the Costa Brava and Cap Ferra, Marrakesh and the Old Bazaar. But there's only one place for you and for I To watch the pageant of life go by The only thing that will always remain Is the dear old sight of an English land The gentle sigh of an English breeze I shall be, shan't I, Herbert? I've always wanted to be Granny Sherwin. Well, I, I assure you I shall do my best, Mrs. Sherwin. Do, my dear. Yeah, what a very lowering conversation. Oh, I think Connie's waving to me. Excuse me, my dear. Well, you heard what she said. Uh, yes, my sweet. I agree with her most emphatically. Uh, don't you? Of course I do. Oh, my love. It's, it's just... Uh, what, my dear? Well, there's only one thing I... Well, yes, dear? I know you always like to have your own way, Herbert, and it's quite right that you uh, should. Uh, what is it, darling? Well, I know what I'm going to say is a bit sentimental, but I want you to promise that you won't insist on having the children psychoanalyzed before they can actually speak. <laughs> no, 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 my darling. Any time after the age of two and a half, of course, but I know you'll think I'm mawkish, but let's wait until then, shall we? Yes, my darling, we shall. Uh, we, we will. Dear sweet Herbert. <laughs> and I shall sing it at the wedding, and I shall also sing it now. <laughs> In the streets of Vienna, I've lived in palaces in Vienna. I've waited in a cafe in Louvain. But what is there left when these things pass?
That ends the primal scene, as it were. Nine studies in disloyalty by Henry Reed. This was the cast. Herbert Reeve, Hugh Burden, Hilda Tablet, Mary O'Farrell, Evelyn Baxter, Colin Campbell, Elsa Strauss, Marjorie Westbury, General Gland, Derek Guyler, Nancy Schoen, Dorothy Primrose, Janet Schoen, Gwen Cheryl, Owen Bryan and George Schoen, Dennis Quilly, Wilfred Downing and Marjorie Westbury, Stephen Schoen, Carlton Hobbs, Connie, Gwen Cheryl, Captain Smithers, Frank Duncan, Aeschylus, Aphanisis, Harold Lang, Plankton, Frank Duncan, the flamenco singers, Marjorie Westbury and Dennis Quilly. The music was composed by Donald Swan. Production was by Douglas Cleverton.